Daniel chapter 8, page 593-ish in the scriptures, www.isr-messianic.org or grindstoneministries.com to get a copy at our cost. I don't care what Bible you read, as long as you read it and you are not taking some man wo man's word, including mine, in place of the word of Elohim. By this point, I have asked you, I don't know, 10 times to read the book of Daniel so that you would have some area familiarity as we work our way through it because there's a lot of meat in here. If you haven't read the book of Daniel and if you haven't watched the videos on Daniel 1 through 7 thus far, stop what you're doing. Read the book of Daniel with your own eyeballs. Then, if you feel so convicted, go back and watch those videos so that you have context as to what is happening here in Daniel chapter 8. Tracking, tracking. In the, third, <coughs> in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. So this is after the vision in Daniel 7. And as I mentioned in the Daniel 7 video, the remaining chapters of Daniel uh, flesh out the vision that Daniel had in Daniel 7. They're not the same visions, but the themes are the same. And I looked in the vision, and it came to be while I was looking that I was in the citadel of Shushan, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I was the by the river Ulai. All right, begs the question, where the heck is Shushan? Shushan is southeast of Babel, or Babylon. Uh, near the Persian Gulf, near-ish, not on, but near-ish the Persian Gulf. If you look at a map, the northwestern corner of the Persian Gulf, it kind of runs northwest to southeast. And by the top of the Persian Gulf, Gulf, and the top one-third of the Persian Gulf, if you were to go to the eastern shore of the top of the Persian Gulf and go inland several miles from there, you'd find Shushan in modern-day Iran. The Persians, the Iranians are Persian. They are descended from the Medo-Persian Empire, which plays into what we're seeing here. Now, also just for context, Daniel 8 resumes being written in Hebrew. We've talked about the historicity, veracity of the book of Daniel. I believe it is divinely inspired scripture for reasons noted a hundred times throughout this study. Um, but it does bounce around, and it is written in two different languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, and it is written both in the first person and the third person, and multiple different codexes and manuscripts have different inclusions of chapters in Daniel, some ascribed to Daniel, some by Daniel, some written by other people about Daniel, some included in context of Daniel, but some not included in context, depending on which of the 54,000 different denominations you're following. So I've asked you to read Daniel and the extracurricular, non-canonical texts attributed to Daniel, Bell and the Dragon, Susanna, etc. So Daniel chapter 8 is in Hebrew. Previously, Daniel chapter 1, 1 through 2, verse 3 was in Hebrew, and then Daniel 2, 4 through 7, 8 was written in Aramaic. And now we resume in Daniel 8, the Hebrew again, just for your notes. Um, and apologies if I'm a little worked up. I am trying to keep the lid on some fury because there are men out there who are hurting children right now that I am aware of and um, I will not say anything else on this camera. So instead, let us focus on Daniel 8. So Shushan, Daniel's about the king's business Shushan is southeast of Babylon, near the Persian Gulf in modern-day Iran. 
Verse 3, And I lifted my eyes, and I looked, and I saw a ram standing beside the river, and it had two horns, and the two horns were high. Now, a ram, biblically speaking, we think, oh, the set of part one, the sons of Enosh, the sons of man. This has got to be Yeshua, especially because Daniel is prophetic, and Daniel is quoted over and over again in the book of Revelation. Yeah, we're going to touch on that. Spoiler alert, the events as prophesied in Daniel chapter 8 took place after the time of Daniel, unless you're a modern liberal scribe, in which case you say this took place uh, 200 BC-ish, because there's no way Daniel could have known this was going to happen unless it was from Elohim, where the more conservative uh, biblical scholars say, no, this took place 500 BCE-ish. So Daniel's prophesying 300 years into the future. And these prophecies have come true. Then how does that tie into Revelation? And the revelation that Yochanan John had about the second coming of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus the Christ. There are patterns in Daniel 8 that will be followed in end times and are followed in Revelation. Patterns, cycles, Ecclesiastes, for everything there is a season, right? And so we will see an Antichrist in Daniel 8 and foreshadowing of the Antichrist in Daniel 8 because historically speaking these prophecies in Daniel 8 have already come to pass the way that they are intertwined with what we will experience Yah's will be done is they are foreshadowing they are a pattern of what is to come and I lifted my eyes and I looked and I saw a ram it's not Messiah and it ain't us. Standing beside the river, and it had two horns, and the two horns were high. Horns represent power in biblical prophecy. And the one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. So two horns, one higher or bigger than the other, so one more powerful than the other, and the more powerful one came up last. Okay. What, is it? <coughs> what does it mean, Bear? Well, if you read Daniel already, you know that the answer to this question is in verse 20, which we will get to momentarily. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast could stand before him and there was no one to, to deliver from his hand. While he did as he pleased and became great. And I was observing and I saw a male goat came from the west over the surface of all the earth without touching the ground and the goat had a conspicuous horn, power, between its eyes. Who are we dealing with here? The ram is the Medo-Persian Empire. The small horn of the ram is the Medes. The large horn that came up last is the Persians. It began as the Medo-Persian Empire, and then it became the Persian Empire. The Medes were less and less relevant to the, to the empire. They were uh, overcome by the Persians. So that's who the ram is, the Medo-Persian Empire. Who's the goat with a conspicuous horn between its eyes? Ah, how interesting. The uh, goat is Greece, and the conspicuous or notable horn, depending on the translation that you have, is Alexander the Great. Now, back to the ram. It says here that the ram, verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast could stand before him. These beasts are representing kingdoms, nations. And there was no one to deliver from his hand while he did as he pleased and became great. Interestingly, the Medo-Persian Empire expanded to the north and conquered in the north. They conquered the Scythians, and they expanded to the west, and they conquered the Greeks, and they expanded to the south, and they conquered the Egyptians. This is why liberal biblical scholars say that this book of Daniel had to have been written and compiled uh, no earlier than approximately 200 B.C. because Daniel would have had no frame of reference. He wouldn't have known that the, the Medo-Persian Empire was going to arise and, and fulfill all these things that Yah gave him in a vision because while Daniel is writing this, see in verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Belt uh, Belshazzar, the Babylonian Empire is firmly in its power at this point. So there's no way Daniel could have known this was going to happen, say the liberal Bible scholars. The conservative Bible scholars say, yeah, our God is God. Elohim gave him a vision and it came to pass 300 years later. 
I trend in that direction because there's nothing that Yah can't do, and he's sovereign over all things, including time. So the ram with the two horns is the Medo-Persian Empire. The little horn is the Medes. The big horn that came up last is the Persians who overshined, overshone, whatever. My, my English teacher from the way back is upset at me right now. Who outshined, the Persians outshined the Medes. And the Medo-Persian Empire expanded to the north and took over the Scythians, to the west and took over the Greeks, and to the south and took over the Egyptians. Now, this goat with the conspicuous or notable horn, the goat is the Greeks. And the notable horn is Alexander the Great. And I was observing and I saw a male goat came from the west. Yeah, because the, to the west of the Medo-Persian Empire, you had the Greeks. Over the surface of all the earth, and they did, they expanded. They took over tons of land without touching the ground. They moved swiftly. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in 12 years. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. That's Alexander. And he came to the ram, the goat came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him in a rage of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he became embittered against him, and struck the ram, and broke his two horns. So the goat broke the horns off the ram. Horns represent power, so it's now comparatively powerless compared to the goat. And there was no power in the ram, the Medo-Persian Empire, to withstand him. But he, the goat, threw him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one to deliver the ram, the Medo-Persian Empire, from his hand, from the goats, from the Greeks. And there were a lot of notable battles between the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greeks. There was a lot of warfare there. And the Greeks dominated. And the male goat, the Greek Empire, became very great. But when he was strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four conspicuous ones came up towards the four winds of the heaven. Now, we've talked about this. Alexander the Great dies, and the Greek Empire is split into four rulerships, uh, kind of like uh, military political fiefdoms at this point. Alexander didn't split them when he was alive. He died. And then to reign over the empire, it was broken into four yeah, territories, if you will. <sighs> Cassander, check this out, the four little horns. Cassander, or Cassander, took over the area of Greece, the home turf of the Greek empire. Lysimachus, or Lysimachus, or however you pronounce that name took over Asia Minor, Turkey, that area. Seleucus, whom we shall talk about more in detail in a moment, took over Syria and the land of Canaan, the Promised Land, which is currently uh, being contended for again between the Yahudim, uh, the nation-state of Israel, and their enemies all around them, the Syrians, the Lebanese, the uh, Palestinians, the Persians, the Iranians, the Persians, Medo-Persian Empire, ah, the Archer, launching missiles at people. And then last, lastly, Ptolemy, or Ptolemy, <laughs> took over Egypt as part of the Greek Empire. So these are the four little horns that came up afterwards. And they reached up towards the four winds of the heaven. We see that same symbolism in Revelation 7, chapter 1, the four winds of the heaven. And there's this, this image of them exalting themselves up towards heaven as if they were themselves uh, God, foreshadowing of the Antichrist. And Seleucus, we know, and the Seleucid Empire, as later dominated by Antiochus IV Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, thought himself God. And he was an enemy of God's people. At this time, the tribe of Judah, the Yehudim. Because, remember, Daniel's in Babylonian exile, 
right? And the ten tribes, the house of Israel, has been is in the diaspora, has been scattered to the winds. So that leaves the house of Judah, which is Judah, Benjamin, Benjamin, and uh, most ish of the Levites, and that they become Judah, if you will, the house of Judah, the Yahudim. And so we end up with this push pull between in the Seleucid Empire one of the four governors, if you will, of the four territories of Greece, in the Seleucid Empire, comes up this dude, Antiochus Epiphanes. And he is a really bad guy. Okay, He hates the Yehudim against the Yehudim. All right. And from one of them came a little horn, which became exceedingly great towards the south, Antiochus Epiphanes, and toward the east and toward the splendid land, the splendid land here is a direct reference to the land of Canaan, or Canaan, as the modern-day Yehudim like to say. This little horn, a smaller power, which became exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the splendid land. So in that territory, the Seleucid Empire, the Seleucid dynasty that came out of the fall, out of the death of Alexander, in the land of Canaan, the promised land of the children of Israel, comes up this little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes. And it became great up to the host of heavens as if it was God himself or a son of Elohim. And it caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and trample them down. Now here, at this point forward, we need to rightly divide the word here because there is both things that have happened in the past historically and prophecy for what will come in the future. So there's two lines in time that are happening at the same time here. Stuff that happened 2,200 years ago and stuff that will happen at some unknown time in the future for no man knows the day or the hour, says Yeshua. And remember that when you see air quote pastors prophesying, in the name of God, it shall come to pass. Um, dude, no, no. And if any man prophesies in the name of Elohim and it does not come to pass, do not fear them. Deuteronomy. Fear meaning deeply respect. No man knows the day or the hour. Comma, therefore wait and be watchful, says Messiah. Because he shall come like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's coming, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be on guard. There's even foreshadowing in that of the Pesach, the Passover and the night of watches. If you do Passover, do you do night of watches? Did you read all of Exodus 12? Therefore it is a statute forever, a night of watches, to be on watch. With your loins girded and your staff in your hand and your sandals upon your feet, and you shall eat it in haste because you might have to bug out, just like our forefathers did from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. So your men are up all night at the ready. So, back to, back to Antiochus Epiphanes in the split timeline here. And Antiochus, the little horn, became great up to the host of the heavens, exalted himself as if he was God, and it caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and trampled them down. Mm -hmm. The host, the body of Yahuwah, his people, and the stars to fall to the earth and trample them down. Now, typically in the Bible, when we see the host and the stars, this represents angels. And we know angels have already fallen, Genesis chapter 6. We know that they will fall again, Revelation. We know, but, but also in the Bible, the host of heavens and the stars can mean the Father's chosen people, Israel, Which is really interesting if you meditate on that for a minute. Why, when men of Elohim see angels, they fall down, they do obeisance, and the angels tell them to get up, we're just like you. Think about that. Do not worship us, worship Elohim. Yeah, because we are also the host of the heaven. They're a different creature than we are. They're able to see y'all face to face. But you can read in non-canonical texts, that some of them are jealous of us because of the relationship we get to have with the Father. 
both of which should look like servitude to Elohim. They serve Elohim differently than we do. We get free will in the matter, which is Deuteronomy 28. If you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, then you will be blessed. That's enough of that rabbit hole for right now. But in this particular context, Daniel 8 verse 10, Antiochus is targeting the Yehudim, one of the 12 tribes of the Father's chosen people. The Jews today will say that they are the Father's chosen people. That's true, but they are not the only chosen people of the Father. And the Christians will say, we're the Father's chosen people because of replacement theology, because you didn't continue in his covenants and he disregarded you. Even though if you read the book of Jeremiah, Yah says, where is your bill of divorce? Have I put you away? And then you read Hebrews chapter 8, the renewed covenant, which all of Christendom claims they're under, and the conditions for the renewed covenant. Oh, no, 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 it's a, grace is freely given. The conditions for the new, grace is freely given. But don't mistake having grace and being in a covenant. Just because a woman forgives you doesn't mean you're married to her. Hmm. Hmm. What is grace? Grace is under the law that you should be dead and you're not. That's the grace. But shall we abuse the grace so that sin may abound? I'm sorry. Should we sin all the more so that grace may abound? Abuse the grace. No. God forbid we continue to sin. Which gets back to what is sin. 1 John 3 verse 4. Sin is lawlessness and all who do sin do lawlessness. Which brings it back around to Hebrews chapter 8. Don't do lawlessness because the conditions of the renewed covenant are that the Father's law is in your mind and written on your heart and then he will be your Elohim and you will be his people and he, Yahuwah, will remember your sins and your lawlessness no more. So the Yahudim are not the only chosen people of the Father. The Christians, Big C Christianity and the 54,000 different denominations are not the only chosen people of the Father. And then you can go further into prophecy in Revelation 14, verse 12, and see the conditions for the remnant, those who are left over, the endurance of the saints, the Father's people, are those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and keep the commands. They believe in Messiah and they keep the commands. And I could super duper jump into that rabbit hole, but I think we've smashed that enough times here. And I know some of y'all are probably yelling at your device right now, do, do it, bear! As the spirit moves, homie. So, Antiochus Epiphanes, verse 10, and it became great up to the host of the heavens and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and trample them down. We will see this in end times with Antichrist. This also happened in roughly uh, 170 AD-ish. I'm sorry, BC-ish. It even exalted itself as high as the prince of the host, this little horn, Antiochus, and took that which is continual away from him, away from Yahuwah, and threw down the foundation of his set-apart place. So made himself as if he was God and ended the daily sacrifices, morning and evening sacrifices, and destroyed the foundation of the temple. Okay. See, history's a funny booger. We know that this has already happened under the reign of Antiochus, but this is also a pattern of behavior that we will see the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, engage in. And because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn, over to Antiochus and the Antichrist, to oppose that which is continual, the daily offerings, a statute and ordinance that was put in place in the Old Testament as part of the Torah, the instruction, the law. The Antichrist will oppose the Torah and threw the truth down to the ground, and it acted and prospered, this little horn. Now this pattern of behavior, we're going to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 again, because it bears repeating. Jacob, Peter, 
John, Jude, Hebrews. Assuming I can find it with my thumbs. There it is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first, and the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. It even exalted itself as high as the prince of the host, and took that which is continual away from him, and threw down the foundation of his set-apart place. And because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose that which is continual. And it threw the truth down to the ground, and it had acted, and it prospered. Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first. And the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Do you not remember that I told you this while I was still with you? And now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in this time. For the secret of lawlessness is already at work, only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. Now remember, this is written by Shaul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul, who was a Jew, as were Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Yeshua, and all the apostles, and all of the early church, so they were very, very aware of the book of Daniel. In fact, Yeshua quotes the book of Daniel in Matthew chapter 24, the abomination that lays waste. They had context with the book of Daniel. They also understood and knew the history of Antiochus Epiphanes because this was only mm, 200 years before the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah that this took place. And there was a dude named Judas Maccabeus, Yehodadek Maccabeus, the Maccabean Rebellion that we're going to talk about in a moment. They were very familiar with this, just as even the dumbest Americans can give you some cursory overview of what the Revolutionary War in the United States of America looked like, even though they weren't there 200 years ago. So, Shaul of Tarsus the Apostle Paul, a Jew who followed a Jew, Matthew chapter 1, Messiah was a Jew, I was nailed to the cross, bear, go read Colossians 2.14, homie, before you quote it at me. Uh, and I'm not saying you need to engage in modern day rabbinical Judaism or reform Judaism. You don't because it's all based on the Talmud and the Talmud's a bunch of stuff that dudes made up. Judaism has missed the mark just like Christianity has. Do not add to or take away from the, the words of this law. That's Old Testament and New Testament. And the Jews have added to with the Talmud and the Christians have taken away from because they don't read or keep the Torah. So they're both off the mark here, which is why they're both going to have a really hard time recognizing Messiah when he returns again. And here's the endurance of the, of the saints, those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and keep the commands. It's both, not either or, it's both. So Shaul of Tarsus knew what he was talking about here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They had context on this. So when we go to verse 8, and then the lawless ones shall be revealed, whom the master, Yeshua, so the master is not the lawless one. Let's compare contrast here. Then the lawless ones shall be revealed, whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. The lawless one is according to the working of Satan. So you hear anybody teaching and preaching that we don't have to do the law. That is the working of Satan. Says Shaul of Tarsus, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, in the New Testament, in the Bible, that we all acknowledge is divinely inspired. 
But Galatians, go read Galatians. Actually, before you read Galatians, read all of the Torah, then start doing it so that you'll have an infinitesimal understanding of the doctorate level teaching that Shaul of Tarsus is doing in Galatians. And then understand that it was written to the church at Galatia in context 2,000 years ago. Then it might begin to make sense. Same thing with Romans. Same thing with Ephesians. Then it might begin to make sense for you. You're not familiar with the study materials that are being referenced in those teachings by one of the greatest rabbis of all time, Shaul of Tarsus. So of course it's easy to take it and make it say whatever you want it to say. Because you're not standing in truth on what the word says when you pull those things out of context. And even if you're reading it in context, if you don't understand the reference material, it won't help you. If, I'm, if I hand you a manual on how to do a field expedient tracheotomy, and you've never seen the equipment before, you've never done one before, and it's pressing that you get this done or somebody dies, what do you think the likelihood of your success is holding the manual in your hands? It's goose egg, bro. It's zero. Because you don't rise to your level of expectation, you fall to your level of training. And very few people are even doing the Torah to understand the references that Shaul is making in Galatians, Romans, Ephesians. And Shaul was a genius. I've had my own personal issues with Shaul. It's because I didn't understand what he was saying. And I had to subordinate my ego and think to myself, maybe this guy knew more than I do. Maybe he's trying to teach me something here. And the answer is he is. And Yah preserved that doctoral level, doctorate level teaching for us here in this word so that we would have access to it to continue to walk and grow in our faith as Peter called us to do in 1 Peter 2.21, to walk after Messiah. Because all these men who wrote all these words in this book are just a shadow of what Mashiach is. And he's not the lawless one. The enemy is the lawless one. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth but have delighted in unrighteousness. This lawless man that Shaul is talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the Antichrist that Yochanan, John the Revelator, sees in Revelation that follows the pattern that was established by Antiochus Epiphanes 300 years after Daniel had his vision in Daniel chapter 8. Because that's how badass Yah is. Because he can give us breadcrumbs to follow. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Daniel 8, 13. Then I heard a certain set-apart one speaking, and another set-apart one said to that certain one who was speaking, so two angels speaking, or set-apart one could be saints, two saints speaking in Daniel's vision, which is interesting because if you are a set-apart one, has a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and keeps the commands, Daniel might have had a vision about you. Then I heard a certain set-apart one speaking, and another set-apart one said to that certain one who was speaking, Till when is the vision concerning that which is continual, and the transgression that lays waste to both make, set, both, to make both the set-apart place and the host trampled underfoot? <sighs> And he said to me, for 2,300 nights, or literally evenings and mornings, then that which is set apart shall be made right. And it came to be when I, Daniel, had seen the vision that I sought understanding and see before me stood one having the, the appearance of a mighty man. All right. So that's the vision that Daniel had. And then it's going to be explained to him by no less than the archangel Gabriel. Gabriel, hey, this is what you saw. This is what it means. Now, 
the 2300 evenings and mornings. We're going to touch into that. Remember, Antiochus 4, Epiphanies, Roman numeral 4, IV, Epiphanies, and the pattern of the Antichrist. Antiochus himself. In the, under the Seleucid dynasty, coming from the fallout of the death of Alexander the Great, who was Greek, who trampled over the Medo-Persian Empire, Antiochus exalted himself as if he was God. He stopped the temple sacrifices, and he murdered and persecuted the Yahudim. Patterns of behavior. It's part of why it's understood that in end times, in order for the Antichrist to arise, there has to be a temple with sacrificial offerings. And some say it doesn't have to be a temple, it just has to be on the Temple Mount. And some say it doesn't even have to be on the Temple Mount. The Yehudim, the Jews, just need to resume their daily offerings. Whatever. That's not worth arguing. And I frankly don't want any comments on it down below. Uh, it's not a matter of salvation, and none of us really knows, do we? But it does give me pause when every year the Yahudim like to publish it. They've got seven uh, red heifers that they're examining for the cleansing of the temple to begin the daily offerings again. Now, luckily for us, these Yahudim have been blinded with their own doctrines and dogmas that when the Torah says you want a perfect one without spot or blemish, what it means is perfect one is a phrase to mean without spot or blemish that it's not a bad one. It doesn't have busted legs, bad genes, googly eyeballs. It isn't sickly, mangy. It's a good one because... From our lessons with Cain and Abel, an offering should cost you something. You give Yah your best, not something subpar, mediocre. An offering should cost you something. But because the Yahudim are wrapped around the axles with a perfect one, they literally take a magnifying glass to a cow, and if it has more than two different colored hairs on it other than red, it's not perfect, they can't slaughter it to cleanse the temple. When, because they're so wrapped around the axles, when they don't even realize that what they're doing when they burn the red heifer is they're making soap to literally cleanse the temple. Is there metaphoric and spiritual aspects to this? Sure. But the reason it's a heifer upon which a yoke has never come, it's never done any work, is so that it has a very high fat content and you burn it with cedar and hyssop, and that makes lye. And you add that, the fat, plus the ash of the fire, plus the antimicrobial, antiviral aspects of cedar and hyssop, and you add that to water to make the waters of purification, which is soap. Has anybody ever seen Fight Club? They're making soap. So when it says they cleansed the temple, they literally cleansed the temple with the waters of purification that they made, which, by the way, same waters that Yeshua performed his first miracle with, turning water into wine. And I know the Baptists like to say it was grape juice. It wasn't. The word is wine in every translation, in every manuscript, in every codex on planet Earth. It's wine. So, the reason, prophetically, there needs to be a temple, if you'll allow me that, temple mount, temple ruins, temple something, and daily sacrifices because in end times the Antichrist will stop the daily offerings for 2300 mornings and evenings. Patterns of what is to come. With Antiochus having already done this approximately 165 BC or 170 BC. 2300 evenings and mornings could mean 2300 days, which is just short of seven years. We know from the book of Revelation and Daniel's teachings, 42 months minor tribulation or three and a half years, 42 months, three and a half years, great tribulation. However, Yeshua himself teaches that the days will be shortened so that even the very elect us aren't deceived. So 2300 days is just prior to seven years. 
Now, in the time of Antiochus, from the time that Antiochus began the persecution of the Yehudim in earnest to the time that the temple was cleansed by Yehudadek Maccabeus on 25 December 16 or 165 BC was just shy of seven years or 2300 days. So that was fulfilled 300 years after the time of Daniel to the letter. Coincidence, I'm sure. So it's possible that it's 2,300 years. Also, if you haven't read Maccabees, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, or at least pulled up the Wikipedia article or whatever reference you're comfortable using about Yehodadek Maccabeus, Judas Maccabeus, or um, the Maccabean Rebellion, you should read that so that you're familiar with the context that we're talking about here. And yes, at some point, we will read Maccabees together on camera. I will begin the non-canonical texts after I have completed the canonical texts on camera. And so we have Daniel 9 through 2 Chronicles left to go before we begin the non-canonical texts. Still about a third of this Bible left that we need to read together. This part that's standing up, maybe a quarter, represents the portion of the Bible thus far that we have not read together. And be it Yah's will, we will get that done. And a lot of that is Proverbs and Psalms. We shall see. So, the 2300 mornings and evenings that the temple sacrifices are stopped is both foreshadowing of the Antichrist to come, and it's also the actuality under the reign of the Antiochus Epiphanes in the Seleucid Empire, which encompassed Syria and what we now call Israel, Canaan, Canaan, the promised land, that during the Maccabean Rebellion, when Antiochus first began persecuting the Yehudim, from that time to when Yehodadek Maccabeus took the temple back and cleansed it, was just shy of seven years, or 2,300 evenings and mornings. And that occurred on 25 December 165 BC, which is where you get Hanukkah from. And just as a cross-reference, to say that this hasn't been fulfilled yet, you can go to John chapter 10, verse 22. John chapter 10, verse 22. Yeshua, at that time, the Hanukkah came to be in Jerusalem, and it was winter. The Hanukkah, the festival of dedication, which Yeshua was in Jerusalem to observe. So again, Matthew chapter 1, you're in Ketubah Covenant, you believe in, your Messiah is a Jewish guy. And if he wasn't, he wouldn't be the Old Testament prophesied Messiah. And I don't mean a modern rabbinic Judaism Jewish guy. I mean a guy who kept the Father's word perfectly. But he was also a Jew. He was from the tribe of Judah. But he didn't care about the religion of Judaism. So you have to separate the people group of the Yehudim from the religion of Judaism. The Pharisees themselves, today's rabbis, claim to be the successors of. Modern rabbinic Judaism is based upon the teachings of the Pharisees and rooted in the Babylonian Talmud, polluted by this exact situation that Daniel's going through right now. They lost their way. That's why Yeshua is rebuking them all throughout the Gospels. You hypocrites. You tithe the mint and the anise and the cumin and the rue, but you've ignored the weightier manners of righteousness and right ruling. You should have done both. You can have your little Jewish traditions, but not above and over the word of Elohim. That's why when the rich man, the rich kid comes to him, Matthew 19, 17, and he says, Master, what shall I do to have everlasting life? Yeshua says, guard the commands. And the kid says, which ones? And Yeshua starts quoting the Torah at him. Exodus chapter 20, the Big Ten, and Leviticus 19. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be set apart as Yah is set apart. The Torah. And the kid says, all this I've watched over from my youth. 
Yeshua says, if you wish to be perfect, go and sell everything you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Because you, rich kid, have a stumbling block. You've put your identity in all of these things and this wealth that you have, not in Elohim. But the commands that Yeshua tells this rich kid to follow are the Torah, not the teachings of the Yehudim. So Hanukkah, even though today is encompassed in the teachings of the Yehudim, is a remembrance of the Maccabean Rebellion and Yehodadek Maccabeus cleansing the temple 25 December 165 BC. And so we know the temple was cleansed. We know this already happened because Yeshua was walking in the cleansed temple at the time of Hanukkah, which is a remembrance of these things prophesied in Daniel chapter 8 having already happened. And also, your Messiah went to the temple on Hanukkah. He didn't put lights on a pagan evergreen tree. He didn't pass his children over to Molech. He was not born 25 December. Ah, where did that date come from? Maybe do some research on the early church. Where did that date come from? 25 December. That's Christmas Day. Christmas isn't a, isn't a biblical holiday. It's a Christian holiday, but it isn't a biblical holiday. Do not add to or take away from the word of this Torah. So, there's your proof text in John chapter 10, verse 22. This stuff already happened. Because if it hadn't already happened, not only would we have non-biblical historical texts documenting that it already happened, uh, there would be no remembrance, no Hanukkah of Yeshua walking in the temple. Okay? Okay. Cool. So the 2,300 days and nights could be just shy of seven years. It could also be 1,150 days. Some Bible historians, Bible scholars say that it's, you know, 1,150 mornings, 1,150 evenings. <clears throat> because of that word, it's literal. In verse 14, for 2,300 nights, it's translated in the scriptures, but it literally is evening and morning. 2,300 evenings and mornings. So is evening and morning one unit of time for a day? Or is it a combination of 2,300 evenings and mornings, which would give us 1,150 of each, which would be just shy of three years? Now, if you go with that, oh, it's just shy of three years. Um, that could be from the time of temple desecration, when Antiochus desecrated the temple, to the time that it was cleansed, 25 December 165 BC, by Yehodadek Maccabeus. Cross reference here, Second Maccabees chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Either way, it still works prophetically, which is super cool that Yah did that for us. And as already said, this prophecy has been fulfilled. This already happened historically, which is why Yeshua is walking in the temple on Hanukkah. But it's a shadow of what is to come with the Antichrist as well. So, let's go to Gabriel in verse 16 explaining to Daniel what he's seen here. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, the river, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Between the banks. What's in between the banks of the river? The river. A man standing in the water. Dude, there's so much power and imagery in that. Waters represent power and peoples and nations in the Bible. Where was Yochanan standing when he baptized Messiah? How do we ritually cleanse with water? How many other visions are in this Bible where there's a great man standing in the water, or one foot in the water and one foot on the shore. Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. He then came near where I stood, and when he came I feared and fell on my face, but he said to me, Understand, son of man, for the vision is for the time of the end. So again, this, this has already happened, but it's also for the time of the end, which has not yet come. There are some weirdos out there who that say, say that we are living in the millennial kingdom right now. Messiah says, you shall know them by their fruits. This is what the millennial kingdom looks like? 
and I'm not saying that to blaspheme Elohim, uh, one single test. Where's Messiah? Okay, then we're not in the Millennial Kingdom. For the vision is for the time of the end. And, as he was speaking with me, I fell stunned upon my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up straight and said, Look, I am making known to you what shall take place in the latter time of the wrath, for the appointed time shall be the end. The appointed time. The latter time of wrath, end times, as prophesied by Yochanan in the book of Revelation. For at the appointed time shall be the end. Appointed time... Many Christian scholars and preachers and pastors will say, when Yah's time is right, when he appoints, this will come to pass. Yes, comma, what are the appointed times? The Moedim, the High Holy Days, the Feasts of Yahuwah or Elohim, found in Leviticus 23. Which means, not only, means to me, not only, should you be keeping the Moedim, because Yah said so, a law forever throughout all your generations and all your dwellings, how long is forever? Not only should you, not somebody, you, as a believer in Messiah, be keeping the Moedim, because what would Jesus do? He'd keep Torah, read the Gospels, he'd go to the temple on the Sabbath, he'd go to Jerusalem on the high holy days, he'd eat clean, he'd wear zitziot, he would heal the sick. He would speak the word of Elohim. He would not back down from tyrannical pressure. That's what he would do. He would have compassion. He would forsake not the widow and the orphan. For this you were called at Messiah, having suffered for your sins, that you would walk in his steps. 1 Peter 2.21 Do what he did. He did the Moedim. So not only should you do the Moedim, the appointed times, the high holy days, the feasts of Yahweh your Elohim, because Yah said so and because Messiah did it, here is the endurance of the saints, but because it is a calendar and it marks the passage of time like a calendar does. And I would submit to you, I think when things go stupid here on planet Earth, and it is end times, it will begin with, we will begin marking time at the Pesach, the Passover, because that is the first year, or the first new moon of the year in the ritual calendar. And it marks the beginning of the year for us in the ritual calendar. Well, wait a minute, I thought the day after Sukkot was the, was the first day of the year. Yeah, from the governmental Jewish calendar, the biblical calendar. The first new moon, the new moon of Aviv, marks the ritual calendar for which we mark time, appointed times, with the new moon, as commanded by keeping the new moon festivals in the Old Testament, so that we know what the day and the hour is. Therefore, wait and be watchful. Gird your loins, have your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, eat it in haste, because you may have to bug out. And that will be when death has passed us over. And it's prophesied by Jeremiah and others that there will be a second exodus that is so great we will no longer talk about the first one. When the Father gathers all nations and tongues back to him. Where? In Jerusalem. Which is where Mashiach is King of King and Lord of Lords. Read the book of Revelation. So I think it's a high probability that some Passover sometime in the future marks the beginning of when death has passed us over, when the children of Elohim had lights in their houses, but all the nations were in a thick darkness, and their firstborn are killed, and their crops fail, and their rivers turn to blood, and their false gods have to acknowledge Elohim, and their magi, their pharmakia is powerless against Elohim. Because of the blood of the Lamb. Yet another reason to do the Moedim. They're all prophetic. Understand, son of man, for the vision is for the time of the end. And as he was speaking with me, I fell stunned upon my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up straight. And said, look, I'm making known to you what shall take place in the latter time of wrath. For at the appointed time shall be the end. 
The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire. And the male goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is its first king, Alexander the Great. And that it was broken and four stood up in its place are four rulerships arising out of the nation, Seleucid dynasty, Ptolemy, etc. But not in its power. The Greek empire never rose to its former glory after that. And in the latter time of their rule, when the transgressors have filled up their measure, a king fierce of face and skilled at intrigues shall stand up patterns of the Antichrist. And in his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy incredibly and shall prosper and thrive and destroy mighty men and the set-apart people. Us. Patterns of the Antichrist. And this is, of course, speaking of Antiochus Epiphanes in history 22 years ago, prophetically written and or compiled by Daniel and friends 2,500 years ago. And through his skill, he shall make the deceit prosper in his hand. Deceit, hmm, like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And hold himself to be great in his heart and destroy many who are at ease and even stand against the prince of princes, the son of Elohim. Yet without hand he shall be broken. Now Antiochus Epiphanes died of disease. He wasn't killed in battle. Nobody stuck a knife in his throat. He died of a disease. Mashiach, without hand he shall be broken. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What's the word of testimony, by the way? Capital W. What did Moses put in the ark as a what? As a witness and a testimony to the children of Israel. Yeah, that's right. The Torah, the covenant, two copies of. Because contract always has at least two copies. A covenant is a contract between two or more parties. The blood of the Lamb and the word of Capital W, word of our testimony. Here's the endurance of the saints. Those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and keep the commands. Because you don't even know who Yeshua HaMashiach is if you don't keep the commands. Because churchianity has blasphemed him into the man of lawlessness, which is the working of Satan from the mouth of Shaul in the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Messiah will destroy this Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes of the future who is the Antichrist, not with his hands, but with the sword that comes forth from his mouth. And that sword is what? The word. Because the word is is the antithesis of lawlessness. It is not possible for lawlessness to destroy the word, but it is prophesied from the first word in the Bible, Bereshit. Got a teaching on that on the alternate channel, Blue Collar President. It is prophesied from the first word in the Bible, Bereshit, that the word will destroy lawlessness and what was said in the vision of the evening and morning is truth and hide the vision for it is after many days it is after many days now in context of Daniel this would have been 300 years after his time impossible for him to know this without the hand of Elohim on him but also we're now 2,500 years into the future from the time of Daniel, and this has not come to pass yet prophetically regarding end times. And hide the vision, for it is after many days. And I, Daniel, was stricken and became sick. He was so ate up with anxiety over this that he couldn't get out of bed. Then I rose up and went about the king's work. There's still work to do for the kingdom. Here, metaphorically, regardless of how much anxiety you may have about these things. And I was amazed at the vision, but there was no understanding. He saw it, 
but he couldn't grasp what he was looking at it here. Now, Gabriel, Gabriel, you might have heard of him. He's kind of like a top dog up there in the host of the angels. Gabriel tells Daniel, hide the vision for it is after many days. There's another book we see Gabriel in, several in fact, but there's another one. You might have heard of it, it's called the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter one, verse three, it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and guard what is written in it, for the time is near. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and guard what is written in it, for the time is near. And if we go to Revelation 22, verse 10, 11 verses away from the end of the Bible. You know what? We'll start at six. And he said to me, who's he? This angel given Yochanan a tour, a vision. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And Yahuwah Elohim of the set apart prophets, like Daniel, has sent his messenger to show his servants, like Daniel, so a continuation here, to show his servants what, is, what has to take place with speed. See, I am coming speedily. Blessed is he who guards the words of the prophecy of this book. And I, Yochanan, John, saw and heard these matters. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the messenger who showed me these matters. And he said to me, see, do not, for I am your fellow servant. See, that goes back to where we read over here in Daniel 8. And it became great up to the host of the heavens and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and trample them down. I am your fellow servant. We are just as important as the host of the heaven. We're just made differently than they are. Revelation 22, 9. And he said to me, See, do not, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brothers the prophets, and of those who are guarding the words of this book, worship Elohim. Of your brothers the prophets. Is this a man of Elohim who has passed on, who is stewarding Yochanan through this vision that he is seeing? Of your brother the prophets. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not preaching on this. I'm just spitballing. Maybe this is Daniel showing, stewarding Yochanan through this vision. He goes, dude, I know it's scary. I've been here before, man. Check this out. Have you seen this yet? See, do not, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brothers, the prophets, and of those who are guarding the words of this book, worship Elohim. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. And I will leave you with this because the time is near. I do not believe we are in end times. But I believe with a high level of confidence that we are knocking on the door of chaos. And I've told you the pattern for the Antichrist here, as prophesied by Daniel in Daniel chapter 8. I've told you that historically Daniel chapter 8 has already been fulfilled. But there are two timelines at work here in Daniel chapter 8. And so we see the playbook of the enemy, Hasatan, the Nahash, Satan. Both in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Daniel 8 and elsewhere. It begs the question, where's our playbook? What do we do? And so with that, I would again encourage you to read about the Maccabean Rebellion, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. It's basically two core tenets. 
the unadulterated worship of Yahuwah, and guerrilla tactics against the superior fighting force. And I will leave you with that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for spending time in the Word with me. And I hope you all have a blessed day. Shalom.